one there to get a quorum to go on. Okay. Hey, ask ACT to please start the live feed. Thank you very much, members and members of the public. Welcome to our Planning Regulatory Service Committee meeting on Wednesday, the 7th of February. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regulatory section of the Hybrid meeting of the Planning Regulatory Service Committee. Can I ask everyone to please mute the microphones at all times when I'm invited to speak by myself? For those of you who are physically in the council chamber, can I remind you that when speaking into your microphone, you need to wait until you see yourself on the screens so the live feed can pick up your comments. If you speak before your image is projected, those listening on the live feed or via Zoom will not hear anything that you say. This is obviously particularly important in the case of a vote being required. Audio recording is also being used to assist in preparing the formal minutes. Therefore, anyone participating in the meeting consents to being recorded and being live streamed on YouTube. Okay, moving on to agenda item one, apologies. We have a, an apology from Councillor Mullen. Do we have any other apologies? No, okay, thank you. Agenda item two, declarations of interest. As per norm, we'll take them now or as we come to them during the, the course of the meeting. Okay, and then we go on to agenda item three, report from the head of planning. Uh, 3.1 is item four decision. There's a review of planning regulatory regulations, Northern Ireland Act 2015. I'm going to bring in Sinead McAvoy. She is to my right. Go ahead, Sinead, over to you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Chair. Yeah, good afternoon, members. The Department for Infrastructure is inviting views from the Council to identify and inform potential changes to the Development Management Regulations Northern Ireland 2015. As you may recall, the 2022 review report on the implementation of the Planning Act included several actions, which included the Development Management Regulations. The Development Management Regulation describes and assigns classes of development to reasonably significant major or local developments category. The threshold table sets out nine classes of major development, each with a description and relevant threshold or criterion. This report focuses on a review of the existing thresholds and categories of development to determine the need for revisions. There are 10 questions in the draft response to each are included in Appendix 1 of your report. There's also a section on predetermination hearings. A predetermination hearing impacts major developments which are considered reasonably significant as regards the threshold of development. A proposed major development which meets or exceeds the threshold or criterion in column three is not automatically classified as reasonably significant. The respective applicant must first consult with the Department of Infrastructure to establish if the department considers the development to be reasonably significant. Where following consultations, the department is of the opinion that the proposed development would not, in their view, be reasonably significant, it would advise that the respective application must be made to the appropriate council. In these circumstances, before an opinion is formed on the application, the council must hold a pre-determination hearing. This report agrees the proposal to make all pre-determination hearings discretionary for councils in the exercise of their functions. And finally, a section to provide both in-person and online electronic pre-application community consultation engagement for all major development. During COVID, the requirements for public consultation event was suspended. And during that time, electronic means of pre-application community consultation engagement were advanced quite significantly. The report now seeks our views on whether these uh, online engagement community consultations should become mandatory. Our draft response is that the pre-application community consultation exercise should incorporate online and digital aspects into the pre-application community consultation process. However, the public event should still be kept to facilitate those who are not technically minded. It is recommended that the members approve the draft response to DFA, which is attached to Appendix 1, in respect of the public consultation on the review of the Planning Development Man Management Regulations, Northern Ireland 2015. And I am happy to take any questions that members may have on those aspects. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Sinead. Yeah, members, over to yourselves. Any questions? No questions. Okay. 
as there's no questions, members, going to, it is an item for decision. Can I get a proposal and a second report? Proposed by Alderman Wilson and second by Councillor Armstrong. We all agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much, members. Okay, move on to uh, items for information 3.2 and 3.3. 3.2 is Northern Ireland Planning st Statistics, second quarter of 23-24. I'm going to bring in Damien to present the report. Okay, over to yourself, Damien. Thank you. Yep, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Members, the report before you relates to a statistical bulletin published by Department of Infrastructure for quarter two of the current business year. It uh, provides an overview of planning activity across all planning authorities. Um, I don't propose to go through the report verbatim, uh, members, but, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I'll pick out a, a few headline points for you. Um, in relation to the 30-week statutory target, uh, Council comfortably met the target with a processing time of 27 weeks. Uh, regarding the 15-week statutory target for processing local applications, the Council unfortunately missed the target with a processing time of 24 weeks. The processing time for local applications across the 11 councils ranges from 9.6 weeks to 41 weeks. And we were positioned approximately midway within that range. Uh, furthermore, members, only four of the 11 councils met the local's target. Turning to statutory target for enforcement, uh, members are asked to note that the bulletin does not report on this target as the data is currently unavailable. Uh, but that that information will be published uh, at a later date. Also of interest, uh, members during quarter two, is that of the 11 councils, we issued more decisions and conclude more enforcement cases uh, than any other council. Uh, happy to take any questions or queries, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damien. Okay, members, it is name of, of information. I'm going to open the floor if any questions. No questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. I'm going to move on to 3.3 and again bring in Damien for an update on the planning applications case loads. Okay. Be yourself, Damien, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, just to uh, give you some some details of our, well, how we did over the, the month of January. Um, during January, we issued uh, 83 decisions. Uh, number of applications received during the same month was 62 which leaves us with the current live case load of 1,024. So you'll note from that, members, that we're actually down uh, 21 cases on last month uh, and 44 for uh, the year overall. We commenced the year at around 1,068 cases. Uh, so clearly going in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> and then number of call-ins, excuse me, number of call-ins received uh, during the month of January was three bringing the total for year to date to 26. Um, happy again to take any questions or queries, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damon. And again, members, item for information, if any questions? No questions? Thank you. Dame, and Damon, can you pass on to the team? Thanks from the committee for their, for their hard work. Okay, move on to agenda out of four. Confidential report. Can I seek a proposal and seconder to go into uh, committee? Proposed by Councillor Armstrong, seconded by Councillor O'Dowd. All agreed? Okay. Okay. Members and online viewers, in accordance with Schedule 6 of the Local Government Act, we will now be moving into confidential, confidential session of the Council. This means it will be turned off the public feed of the meeting. This will be returned when the meeting is restarted. Can I ask ACT officers to please turn off the feed and confirm when we can proceed in confidential business?
please start restart the live feed. Thank you. Yeah, members, uh, welcome back to the members of the public. Can I uh, move on to agenda item six, which is corresponds, we, which we have none. Agenda item seven, any other relevant business? And I'm going to bring in Councillor Lavery, who's online. Uh, he's going to talk about the Belfast Telegraph article. Okay, Councillor Lavery, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. All our publications are, are available, I suppose. No, as you mentioned, it's just in relation to a comment that I've seen the Belfast Telegraph article relating to councillors' ability to take decisions to plan an application if they have not attended a site visit. In the article, um, it says that you know, council didn't prohibit members from voting on any application if they have not attended a site visit and it's up for the elected members to decide whether or not to participate in the application decision. This took me a bit by surprise, uh, Chair, because over the last four and a half years that I've been on this committee, the standard practice that we've always been told was that they have to be present for every aspect of the application or every time it comes to committee. And, you know, on a site visit too, and you're strongly advised not to take part um, if if you haven't attended everything. So obviously that statement's sort of a bit out of, out of keeping with that. So I'd just like some urgent clarity on the matter, maybe a report brought to the next committee uh, meeting about what, what the advice actually is, because I note in the same article, a lot of other councils uh, cite, uh, cite um, meetings that you know, seem to be um, optional and you know, you're still able to take a decision. Um, some members may feel that due to the comprehensive natures of the plan and the planner's report, which are normally very good and very detailed, they'd still be able to take um, a decision on the matter, even if they haven't attended a site visit. Um, so no, we deal with a lot of applications every month, so it'd be good to get some clarity on that urgently as to whether we can or cannot, or you know, just the whole ins and outs of it, Chair. Um, you know, if, if a report on the matter could be brought brought uh, back to committee at the earliest op opportunity. Thank you. Thank thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lavery. Yeah, I'll bring in the on here to sort of respond to your your questions, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lavery. Councillor Lavery, more than happy to bring a report back um, next month, um, but even just um, maybe to give some clarity this afternoon. Uh, historically, members who were on the committee before the, the last election will recall or even further back, back before 2021, there was provision within the council's protocol that said if you ha if members hadn't attended a site visit, um, they were not allowed to vote on an application when it came back to committee. There was a judicial review um, case in the High Court in 2021 involving a different local authority. And what uh, resulted from that case was uh, essentially Justice Schofield um, ruled that officers couldn't tell members that you are not allowed to vote on an application. You're democratically elected, you have a right to vote. What officers can do is advise members or recommend um, that you don't vote if you haven't been at a site visit. And it is always preferable that members all be in a fully informed position, not only to protect the decision of the council from legal challenge, but also to, to protect individual members um, from any allegations uh, of bias or predetermination. So the general approach, and uh, there was a report brought to committee in December 2021 after that judgment, and this committee decided that our the council's protocol was amended to remove that paragraph that said, if you weren't in attendance at the site visit, you were not permitted to vote. So the protocol does no longer prohibit members from voting. But that's in accordance, you know, it's a decision for members um, taking account of any legal advice you may receive um, on any application that comes before you. So I hope that gives some background and some clarity on the position is that officers can't tell members you can't vote. <laughs> we can we can recommend that you don't, um, but ultimately it's a decision for members. So I hope that gives some clarity this afternoon, but more than happy um, to bring a report to Councillor Lavery if, if you feel you require that next month. Thank you very much, Anne. Do you want to come back in, Councillor Avery? Are you happy enough for that? 
Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, would, I would like a report. You know, I, I wouldn't want to get in a big debate on it now, given that it is AOB, but we're sort of being told or advised that we can vote, but if we do, we might be in trouble. So it's not it's not really clear. I suppose, and again, I don't want to get in get into a whole debate on the issue now. Um, but it will be very, I think, appropriate that a report does come as soon as possible so that we can get into the details on this. Because I think, given the seriousness of some of the decisions that come before committee, Clarity is key. Um, so I would look forward to that report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Lavery. And my, my understanding is what uh, our legal advice was given there is that if you don't attend, then it, it is entirely up to yourself. However, you're leaving yourself open because you haven't had all the information. But happy to, to second the proposal that we um, have further a further report back brought back and on to you know there was training and um, four members on this okay members we have finished aob unless there's any other questions on that okay we're going to move to close for a couple of minutes to uh 1600 hours i shall see you all then okay thank you
Please start the live feed. Thank you. Okay, members, move on to agenda item five, applications for planning permission to be considered by the committee as per schedule of the planning application. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the planning section of the hybrid meeting of the Plan Regulatory Services Committee. Can I ask everyone to please mute their microphone at all times, unless invited to speak by myself. For those of you who are physically in the council chamber, can I remind you that when speaking into your microphone, you need to wait till you see yourselves on the screen so that the live feed can pick up your comments. If you speak before your image is projected, those listening on the live feed or via Zoom will not hear anything you say. This is obviously particularly important in the case of a vote being required. Audio recording is being used to assist in preparing the formal minutes. Therefore, anyone participating in the meeting can sense to it being recorded and being live streamed on YouTube. <clears throat> Also, during the course of the meeting, questions may be asked of councillors who are members of the Planning and Regulatory Service Committee of Planning Officers, applica applicants for planning permission, objectors, or those speaking on their behalf. In doing so, councillors endeavour to ascertain the information which they feel is necessary to enable them to determine the application. However, members of the public should note that councillors will not reach a conclusion as to whether an application should be approved, refused, or deferred until the debate on the application has concluded. Okay, move on to Appendix 1, which is application number LA08-2019-0129F. That's approval, and it's Francis Smith. I'm going to call for a proposal and seconded. We're going to confidential business, please. Proposed by Councillor Armstrong and seconded by Councillor Wilson. One, two, confidential.
key members, we've on to again again to the application in front of us, Appendix One. Members, I'm going to declare an interest, as unfortunately I wasn't able to attend the site meeting. And can I ask a proposer and a seconder to invite Alderman Wilson to take the chair, proposed by Councillor Armstrong, seconded by Councillor Wilson, that Alderman Wilson takes the, the chair. Yeah. Thank you, Alderman. Okay, thanks, uh, Alderman Barr. And um, we'll move ahead of a number of lights on here. So we'll go with Alderman Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. I didn't get the site visit either, either so I'm going to set this one out. Thank you. Councillor, let's go left to right here. Councillor Mutri. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, just declaring that I was unable to attend the site uh, visit, so I will excuse myself from these proceedings. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chairman. In the same vein, I was unable to attend the site meeting, so I'll not be taking part in any decisions in this uh, application. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Duffy. Yes, Chair, as an objector to this application, and is Councillor Donnelly's apologies for this. He's had to leave. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Donnelly's uh, policy is noted. Councillor McGill. I wasn't at the site visit either, so I won't be taking part. Councillor O'Dowd. Um, I wasn't at the site meeting either. I know it leaves very few then in the chamber. So what I would like to say is, is there any chance of another site meeting so more can attend so we're not left with an empty chamber? Okay, I will raise that in a wee second of more people online and then we'll maybe address that. Um, Councillor Hockey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't able to attend the site meeting either, so um, I won't be participating. Thanks. Okay, Councillor Lavery. Thank you, Chair. Is my employer made a representation at committee and that they taken part in the, the, any discussions in this application? Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. So as you are aware, I think that leaves three out of the four that were at the site meeting. So from my opinion on it as uh, Chair on this one and, you know, previous opinions, it leaves us unable probably to consider this at this point in terms of the legal advice we've been having consistently um, all along and what we've heard previously um, just today in the meeting. And I know Councillor um, O'Dowd has raised um, the possibility of having another site visit. I have no idea if that's within the protocol of the planning committee, but what I would like to do is discuss that. But it's probably best because it's um, related to the you know, the procedures of the committee that will maybe do that within with our legal advisor present to give us the best advice possible. So I would propose that we move into legal advice. And if I have a seconder, we can do that. Yeah, Councillor Armstrong. Okay, so I will read out the statement here. So members and online viewers, in accordance with Schedule 6 of the Local Government Act, we will now be moving into a confidential session of the Council. This means that we will be turning off the public feed of the meeting. This will be returned when the meeting is restarted. Can I ask the ICT officers to please turn off the live feed and confirm with me when the confidential section of this meeting can proceed? Thank you.
Okay. Um, so just for the members of the public, we had a, a quite a detailed discussion on uh, a number of issues there. And I think we're going to move um, at this point, if we have any declarations of interest, um, now is the time probably to make them. Councillor O'Dowd. Yes, I was not the site making, so I won't be taking part. And then... Yeah, done. Yeah, deep done. Yeah, okay. Sorry. And Councillor McGillan also. So, uh, members at um, Councillor Armstrong. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I think um, after that lengthy legal um and a uh, discussion there i think it's probably best with what we've discussed with the lack of members uh, available due to apologies from councillor donnelly that we postponed this um application and looking at this application until a later date i think it will be arranged um with planning officers so i propose to make that if that's okay okay thank you councillor armstrong and i was yeah, I'll second that, and that's basically due to the fact that at the site visit we had four members: Councillor Armstrong, myself, Alderman Wilson, um, Councillor Donnelly, and Councillor Mulholland. And at this point, um, Councillor Donnelly had, is an apology; he had to leave, so that leaves us in court for this portion of, of the meeting on this particular application. So I'm happy to second Councillor Armstrong's, um. Proposal that we await the rehearing of this um application when we will be correct. So that'll be arranged and distributed to the participating members. So at this stage, I'll vacate the chair and then we'll invite Alderman Barr back and proceed with item two on the agenda. Thank you. Okay, members, welcome back and thank you very much, Alderman Wilson, for taking over the reins there for Appendix 1. Okay, members, moving on to uh, Appendix 3, application number LA08 2023 2181F, as a refusal. I'm going to bring in Mr. Liam McCrum, Senior Planning Officer, to present report and PowerPoint presentation. We have also David McMaster of David McMaster Architects. He will make representation as the agent in support of the application and we'll bring in Mr. McMaster after Liam has presented. Um, so Liam, whenever you're ready, Liam. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, this application seeks full planning permission for the erection of a dwelling and garage at lands at 36 Fly Road, Bambridge. The application is before members. It was called in by Councillor Evans. Members are, first of all, reminded of the plan and history of the site in that planning permission was granted for a replacement dwelling on the same building under consideration in the current application on the 5th of the 2nd, 2018. This planning permission, however, expired on the 4th of February 2021, and the building has deteriorated significantly from that time with the roof and northeast gable are now non-existent. 
In terms of this application and the principle of development, policy CTY1 of PPS21 identifies a range of types of development acceptable in the countryside. One of these is a, under policy CTY3, replacement dwelling. Policy CTY3 requires that a building to be replaced exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling and, as a minimum, has all structural walls substantially intact. In this case, officers are satisfied that the building exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling, but do not consider that the structural walls are substantially intact. Officers consider that only the front elevation wall to be substantially intact in this case. Other external structural walls are, never, are not substantially intact in that the northeast gable of the building does not exist. The southwest gable is not substantially intact with a large gap approximately mid gable. And the north rear elevation of the building is not substantially intact in that there are trees going through a large gap in the rear wall. The building is therefore not considered to meet the policy test for replacement dwelling. In addition to comply with policy CTY3, there are five additional subtests. As set out in detail of the body of the report, officers consider that four of the five subtests are satisfied. Subtest two requires that the overall size of the new dwelling should allow it to integrate into the surrounding landscape and would not have a visual impact significantly greater than the existing building. In this instance, officers consider that the proposed dwelling is 1.5 storey design with a ridge height of 6.27 metres above ground level with a footprint measuring approximately 220 square metres. Officers consider that the proposed dwelling will have a significantly greater visual impact than the small dwelling being replaced, which has a footprint of 54 square metres and which a ridge height of approximately 4 metres. In officers' view, the dwelling would have to be single storey in design with a ridge height of approximately 5.5 metres and 180 square metres as set out in the previous approval at outline stage. As the proposal does not comply with the relevant criteria of CTY3, the principle of replacement dwelling in this instance is not considered acceptable. Notwithstanding this, and that the principle is not accepted, as this is a full application, matters of design have to be considered. In terms of design and layout, officers consider the proposed dwelling with the ridge height and a footprint as depicted is unduly prominent in the landscape and due to its scale and massing will cause a detrimental change to rural character of the area. Officers therefore consider that it fails to comply with the SPPS, CTY3, CTY13 and CTY14. Officers are satisfied in terms of access and parking and that the proposal complies with PPS3 and officers consider there is no impact on residential immunity. Consideration of the third party representation is set out in detail in the report and refusal is recommended. Okay, I want to take a race through the PowerPoint presentation. Slide, please. Yep, this just shows the site, uh, the location of the site within the general area. Uh, it's just out the site, the small settlement of Corbett, and you can see the large blue areas, the Corbett Lake. Yeah. Next slide, please. This is just an indication of the aerial view of the location of the site. Uh, just beyond one blue arrow gives the remains of the building, and the other blue arrow takes you to where the 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 site is 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 applied for. Next slide, please. This is just our site location plan with the site outline in red. This is our site plan. This is the plans of the dwelling. This is the building to be replaced. Another photograph of our front elevation there, which officers have considered to be intact. Another view of the site and another view of the elevation. I think I'm difficulty actually reading that from here. Um, that's the well building to be replaced. Basically, this is a gives you an indication of the plan and history of the site. Two previous approvals on it. And you can see the variation in the, the length of time of the photographs. One approval there in 2015, one approval in 2017, and the differentiation in between the de degradation of the building over the period of time is where we are where we are today. 
And again, this is the, the building in 2017. It's just a view of the entrance feature. And that's the, essentially this was two dwellings at one point in time. Um, and one section of the dwelling, or the, the one of the dwellings was approved as a replacement. That's it on the opposite side of the road. The, the remnants of the second dwelling are what we consider in this application. Again, just a view of the application site. Again, another view of the site. And again, another view of the site. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Liam. I'm going to bring in Mr. David McMaster as the agent. Um, David, you've been here before. You've got three minutes to give your presentation. Um, the clock will start whenever you start, okay? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Department has stated three reasons for refusal, which we believe cannot be upheld. Considering the first reason for refusal, the Department contend that the external walls are not substantially intact, we would contend this assertion and would point out that the department summary is factually inaccurate as they state that there are trees growing out through a large gap in the rear wall, which is not the case. The wall is intact to a minimum of sill level along its entire length, and any trees are outside the structural perimeter. Our summary of the condition conflicts with the department. Uh, as has been stated, the southern roadside wall is 100% intact. The northeastern wall is more than 50% intact. The northern rear wall is about 75% intact. And the southwestern wall is about 70%. So overall, depending on how you measure areas of wall, uh, we're talking of up to about 80% intact. So we believe the first reason cannot be sustained. They also contend for reasons two and three, that the proposal would be prominent feature with no suitable degree of enclosure. Uh, it's already been referred to the application across the road, which was an off-site replacement. That dwelling has a reach height approximately two metres higher than the current proposal, but it wasn't deemed prominent. Uh, and it should also be noted that there's no landscaping across the front of that, which makes it extremely prominent coming up the road. The current proposal also has a ridge height, which would be approximately 400 millimetres lower than the dwelling to be replaced. In terms of the character of the area, it should be noted that within 350 metres to the southeast of the site, there are currently eight dwellings recently constructed or currently being constructed with no natural screening and all within a frontage of 210 metres and a depth of 260 metres. Our proposal for a single dwelling is not detrimental to this character. The closest and visually linked dwellings are 23 Corbett Road, adjacent and 50 metres northwest of the applicant site, and 32 Corbett Road, 260 metres east. Number 23 is a storey and a half dormer dwelling, while 32 is a large two-storey dwelling enclosed by timber rail fence and dominant on the height skyline. It's difficult to see how the department can argue that the proposal is unduly prominent and would change the rural character. And as such, we believe that the second and third reasons cannot be sustained. Um, we believe a site visit to see the condition may also be beneficial, but in light of this, uh, we would ask that the committee overturns the recommendation to refuse. Thank you. Yeah, many, many thanks, Mr. McMaster. Um, okay, members, one open the floor. Um, I suppose I want to sort of delve into uh, CTY 3 of PPS 21. Um, I suppose I'm going to just to yourself first, Liam, and then to yourself, Mr. McMaster. Um, in terms of, of the policy where it says, um, as a minimum, all external structures, structural walls are substantially intact. 
is there a percentage around that or is there case studies or case law that, that gives us or gives yourselves sort of where we should be sitting on what substantial is? Thank you, Liam. Yes, Chair, there is indeed. Um, we have looked at some PSE decisions and indeed they've been brought before members before with um, other applications that have been to committee. In uh, PSC decision uh, 2016 A0028, um, the PSC determined that when 79% of the external walls were deemed to be substantially in intact, that didn't amount to substantially intact. So while 79% of the four walls seemed to exist, that wasn't deemed to be substantially intact. And in another case there, 2016 A, uh, 2015 A0030, it was 88% of the external walls were in situ, but that was not deemed to be substantially intact. In the submission made by the applicants in this application at the point of calling, the assertion was that this dwelling had at least 70% of its existing walls intact. So on that basis, we felt well within our rights to make the recommendation based on our own position and indeed that backed up by two recent decisions, or not recent, but decisions from the Plan and Appeals Commission. Yeah, thank you very much, Liam. Thanks, Mr McMaster, do you want to come back with, with sort of your version of it, please? Yes, Chair. The, the The problem with this is, you know, the percentages we are, we have coded. It depends on whether you're looking at walls and windows, walls, what was a wall, what was a window. In this particular case, the the gable elevation is, as is, is Liam has quite rightly stated, this was part of a second, two dwellings together. Uh, the planning for the previous dwelling meant that the house had to be demolished next to it. When they demolished that, the gable of this house collapsed, which is why the roof is the roof is still on site, but has collapsed within itself. The rear elevation, it's evident that there were three windows, the same as the front elevation. Timber heads are in place. The timber heads have now rotted. There was a portion of wall above those timber heads and a pier between, which no longer exists. If you preclude the windows as openings, the percentage of wall then goes up. There were a couple of appeals where they were dismissed, obviously, because walls had been rebuilt uh, to try and make it look substantial, and a figure of 50% was quoted. Um, I should have the number. Uh, again, they're, they're, old, they're old cases. Um, it's very difficult to say what is substantial. We also took our measurements from what was visible. Um, there was a lot of rubble inside. If I add on an extra depth for what's covered, that percentage goes up. As I said, we, we were around about 80%. We reckoned uh, is there in situ. Many thanks. Yeah, members, any other questions? Councillor Duffy, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Liam, you said, was there a planning permission on this site and run out in 2021? Yes, Councillor. Uh, there's been two previous planning permissions on this, one in 2015 and one granted again in 2017, but the uh, Ran out in yeah 2021 February 2021, and I suppose the the what we're looking at here is the degradation of the building over the period of time, and from the period it was granted back in 2018, that lapsed in 2021, the the building has degraded, and we're now at a point in time where I suppose what how we're looking at it in the now, we don't believe that it is substantially intact, whereas back in the 2018 assessment. We did believe that it was substantially intact, and that's why that was approved. Would we have acted in, because they wouldn't have been able to do anything right through COVID on the site, would we have factored that into 
anything relating around to this here because basically nobody could do nothing nowhere and the client's hands were tied right through it. So for a number of years, he sort of would have been handicapped around it. No, well, that, that probably, well, the, I suppose there is a context to that, but these were outline applications. There were two outline approvals, so they couldn't actually have commenced work on the ground anyway. They would have had to submit either a reserve matters or a, another subsequent full application within the timeline of the approvals rather than actually commence work on the ground. So it's not like we were, you know, someone was inhibited from doing groundworks or anything to implement an approval. They couldn't implement the approval. It was only two outline approvals, which were mean approvals in principle. Want to come back in? Yeah. Just thank you, Chair. No, just to come back on that, there's basically, I know working in the building trade myself, you couldn't have done anything you probably wouldn't even be interested in the plan for plan permission at that time because knowing there's nothing you could do so it was sort of difficult but it's my total thank you very much councillor and councillor O'Day please thank you chair just out of curiosity, the the plans that was submitted previous were were they the same that's been submitted now? Same measurements? Um, you know, was it going to cover the same ground? Essentially, Councillor, it was the same same footprint and stuff and things, but um, ultimately it was within the same red line, but it was only an outline application. They were both only outline applications, so they are only seeking approval in principle. So there was no design features or anything in those two previous approvals. This up, But there was planning conditions attached to each, which limited the dwelling to 5.5 metre ridge height, which is basically your single storey standard bungalow, and 180 square metres of floor space, which is quite a small dwelling. And what we have is indicated in the report there is a 6.7 metre high dwelling and a 220 square metre something floor space. So they're quite different. Well, they're envisaged to be quite different, I suppose, rather than... Thank you very much, Tim. And thank you, thank you, Councillor. And Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, Liam, I was just wondering on the, the site history um, page there, could you explain what the discharge of condition five entailed and what that means? You know, replacement condition, just to get it in my head. And which which one that referred to was that to the building that was demolished to facilitate the other replacement?
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Wilson. Yeah, essentially that there was a condition attached to the first approval, which was the twenty fifteen approval, uh, about the basically that works certain things had to be put in place prior to the demolition works to the dwelling. That approval was never implemented, so that discharge of a condition doesn't really serve any purpose. just it relates to that 2015 one um and it was the site for replacement well you know this related to a building adjacent to the building under consideration so surely that one you know that one was built and i'm assuming was it a discharge of condition relating to before i mean i don't have a replacement well myself you know the building you know is there a condition that you have to demolish it before you move in or so many you know, a period of time after you move in, you have to have the the building you're replacing demolished. And I suppose that's to prevent um in single situations, you know, another um replacement being applied for, should that building not be demolished. Yeah, Alden Wilson, that, that actually relates to the dwelling that's built across the road. That was a discharge of condition prior to the commencement of the works on that one. So it doesn't have any relevance to this current application. But would it have relevance in terms of if that condition was, you know, you had to demolish that particular portion? So to me, that in fact, you know, that affects the integrity then of the building that's left. And we're dealing with old field stone here with no cement, soil, lime, mortar, and once that gets weathered, you're going to have obvious issues there with the longevity of that building and the impact of the weather on it. I mean, we can see the tin work, tin rusts. You know, we can see, I would have concerned, you know, leaving that, you know, exposed like that when it's an internal wall, obviously, that it is then exposed to the elements because it used to be covered with a roof the full length of it and you had another dwelling beside it. So... I think we'll have to take that into account in terms of the impact that would have on a on a structure. And as Councillor Duffy says, you have COVID slap bang in the middle of all that effect and everything. Um, in terms of how people are going to move forward with their own plans and ideas. And um, you know, I think I know I, you know, in this committee going back a number of years, we've had a number of dwellings which, you know, I have had open discussions with various um senior planners about you know, they believe they are dwellings. To me, they looked like barns, but there was a nugget of information within that that suggested we think there was a chimney here or, you know, with an affidavit from somebody that says, I remember this being a dwell. Mm -hmm. I just struggle with it from your, you know, from the perspective of planners because we have a couple of approvals here. You know, I, you know, with one enacted that it was part of the same, you know, it was two, like a semi detached two two dwellings and it was accepted for one and accepted for the other and outline you know the passage of time has certainly intervene intervened but you know how do we is it purely down to the a calculation of the percentage of the building that's remaining as today as you know today that we are considering this is that the only to me it seems to be the only issue because it's already established that it was a dwelling and I think we'll have to then weigh up the impact of taking the other part of the dwelling down on the structure that's that's left because it's not modern construction techniques by any means. Is there a question there? <laughs> I know. Is it solely down to the Yeah. Liam, <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't too sure why it was a comment or why you were making a question. So, <laughs> no, I suppose I suppose there's two things in that. Alan Wilson, no, you're quite right in that that they are things, but unfortunately, they're not within our policy for considerations. We just have to look at what's in front of us, and it talks about four walls being substantially intact. And I suppose our assessment is at this point in time there isn't, and that's where our consideration really has has been confined to 
But yeah, I take your point on board that yes, once the first approval was enacted, that wall was exposed and did become less. But I suppose that's why at that point in time, they did have outline planning permission with a defined time period to submit in either reserve matters or a full planning application. And that was always the case. You know, the, this didn't allow any works to commence on site. The previous approvals didn't allow any works to commence. It was only an approval in principle. So at any point in time, they knew that they had to either submit either in form of the two subsequent applications to carry out any works to implement that approval. But yeah, you're quite right. The The consideration that we have is just based on the uh, what's on the ground at the moment. Thank you very much, Liam. You have enough content for now. Um, Councillor Armstrong, please. Thank you, Chair. I think we're probably going to quibble on that one for a while on, on whether it was a house or was not. But I want to sort of ask just to reiterate the question to or the about the the height. Um, I I see that that's that was one of the issues that was is was turned down on as well. Um, I just want to clarify. You say that the height is going to be about six point two seven for this dwelling, and then the one across the road is going to be what height is that? The one across the road. I think you mentioned that in your opening remarks about the 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 property across the road. Did you not know, or was that the name? I'm not too sure who you mentioned it. No problem. Want to come in there, smoke master, please. Uh, yes, uh, the house across the road, we, we've looked at it. It had a condition of a ridge height of 5.5, but on the ground there's an underbuild as well. Uh, the figure quoted by Liam uh, is 6.27 for the one we have proposed, but the site slopes and it's in two parts, and the top part's 5.5 and then allowing for the slope where it's 6.27 from finished ground level, so it's approximately six metres. That's still two metres lower than the one approved across the road. It was 5.5 ridge height measured from finished floor level. From finished ground level, that's actually about 6.2, uh, 6.3, because, again, it slopes two ways, and I, I think even from the photograph Liam had put up there, you can actually see the the slope. I, I don't know if it's useful to, to put that photograph back up to explain it. Do you want the photo up, Councillor? We'll get the photos up, please. I think it's three up from that. Yes. If you look at the, the front door, there's a, there are steps down and then the ground slopes towards the road. So at the low point, um, that's probably about seven or 800 mil lower than the finished floor. Add it to the 5.5, takes it up to 6.2, 6.3, which would be equivalent to the highest point of what we have proposed, albeit ours is two metres further down the hill on the opposite side of the road. So thank you, Chair, let me back in. So just on, on what uh, Mr. McMaster is saying there, in keeping with the, the environment of, of the, the area um, and the outlook of, the, of our rural developments, is there going to be much of a devia deviation between the heights of both houses then if what Mr. McMaster is saying is true that both roof points will be at the same height on that exact road across the road from each other? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I suppose the question officers have asked themselves, each, each, each site is, is site specific. They are different. They have different backdrops, they have different levels, so different types of dwelling, irrespective of the ridge height, work differently in different sites. So it's not a matter of just looking at a ridge height of a dwelling and saying on one side of a road similar will work similar to one on the other. That's just not the case. It's it's down to the site specifics of the site, which is boundary treatments, slope and nature of snites, and actually the particular design of the dwelling. So it, it's, it's really not just uh, a, a design thing here. Um, I, I think, I suppose we're getting a bit off where the, you know, the, the, the actual site we're looking at is different than the site across the road. And I suppose there's a different site 
considerations for each individual site. And that's really what we're looking at here. So what might work across the road, and albeit it might only be across the road, there might be a particular set of circumstances associated with the assessment of that application that are different than what we're dealing with here. And what we have looked at is the context of this site and whether the dwelling that's proposed is acceptable on this site. So whether there's something across the road, 10 metres down the road, 350 metres down the road, each site's different. And that's how we've looked at it. Thank you very much, Liam. Councillor, you happy? Okay. Okay, members, any other questions? Okay, no more questions. Okay, we'll move on to debate. So, any comments or views to, to her? Okay, Councillor Wilson, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think with this with this application, if it probably hadn't the history behind it, I know it was outlined planning permission, and the possibly that the building has deteriorated, but there is all them the, the factors to put in the melting pot. And as what Councillor Duffy said there, um, you had COVID in the middle of it, where people weren't probably thinking of of building. And I think there's, I think it uh, should be a wee bit, in my personal opinion, maybe look at this again in some shape or form. A bit of flexibility, I say, with COVID in the middle of it, the, the outline plan of emission and the history of the of the site, possibly there could be something we could look at or something or possibly a site visitor or whatever might clarify a few things a bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. I'm going to bring in Councillor Peter Lavery, please, online. Thank you, Chair. I suppose I've been listening to everything carefully and reviewing the report and I wouldn't necessarily agree with Councillor Wilson or the previous speaker. I think you have to look at it. COVID's kind of irrelevant in this situation and looking at all the facts, it, it does appear that it does not meet plan and policy. In terms of a site visit, I mean, we can see from the pictures that, it, that the you know the, the building is in a fairly poor state of repair and I don't expect the walls to grow in a couple of weeks. So I, I would be quite content that the officer recommendation to refuse is the appropriate uh, course of action in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lavery. And I suppose from your own perspective, looking at the, the CTY um, part of it that I was querying earlier, and what constitutes 70% and what constitutes 80% or even 88%, I think for me, I'm sort of leaning towards a safe visit, but I'm happy to sort of move on to um, a decision, members, if there's no other questions on it or comments to make. If there's no other comments, we'll move on to your decision. So, so over to yourselves, members. Mr. Duffy, please. I recommend go for a site visit. Sure. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. And Councillor Kennedy, please. Thank you, Chair. I think a site visit would be very beneficial. For It is hard to see in the pictures there where you have vegetation. It's obviously, Mr. McMaster says it's growing on the outside of the building, but when you're looking at it here, it's hard to define. So I think if you're on site, it would be beneficial. So I'd be happy enough to second it out there. And my apologies, Alderman Kennedy. And Councillor Lavery, please. Thank you, Chair. I suppose to going on from previous remarks, I, had, I do think the officers have got it right in this instance. I suppose we have to judge the application as it is before us. And I suppose in my view, it's sort of aligned with officers that the, the building does not merit being considered as a replacement uh, dwelling due to its, I suppose, its uh, containing and crumbling nature. So I would be content to propose the recommendation to um, agree that we, um, you know, we offer the recommendation to refuse Based on the points outlined in the report, I don't see how a, a site meeting could be, you know, different than anything that's here before us now. Don't know what all our members are expecting to see, but maybe I'm in the minority of one here. I don't know. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, please we have a proposal by Councillor Duffy and second by Alderman Kennedy. Um, that we 
go for a site visit. Okay, so I'm going to take that first. Uh, we all agreed. No, okay. Yeah. No, okay. So we'll go for a vote. Okay, okay. Bear with me, members, to get the list. <clears throat> yeah, members, proposed by Councillor Duffy, second by Alwyn Kennedy, that we go for site visit. Visit. I'm going to call Councillor Armstrong. Yes, no, abstain. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Donnelly is away. Councillor Duffy, please. Yes, Chair. Councillor Hockey, online, please. Yes, Chair. Councillor Lowry, online. No, Chair. Councillor Mallon is not here. Councillor McGowan. Yes, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mitri. Yes, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mulholland. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Councillor O'Dowd. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Alderman Wilson. Yes, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Yes, Chair. Vice Chair Alderman Kennedy. Yes, Chair. Go ahead. Yes, yes, Chair. Thank you. And Alderman Barr myself is the Chair. Yes. So bear with me, members. Yeah, members, we have yes for the site visit. Um, we have 11 and no's, one. Okay, so the proposal for site visit is passed. Okay. Move on to... Thank you very much, Mr McMaster. Okay, move on to appendix four, application number LA08-2017-1128. F answer approval. I'm going to bring in Sinead McAvoy, planning manager, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. We've also members, we have Bobby Jamison from Portadown Recycling to make representation as the agent. Um, he's actually only here for questions. Okay. Um, okay, members, and we'll bring him in after. Um, Sinead, where are you hiding? There you are. Okay, over to yourself, Sinead. Thank you, Chair. The application is for a change of use of existing yard to form an extension of the existing yard space at an existing recycling plant and construction of storage bays, tar baling unit, including four new additional waste codes and the revision of a three metre high earth mound along the western and northern boundaries. The reason is before the plan regularly service committee tonight is because it has attracted objections from four or more separate postal addresses and is recommended for approval. Order down Skip Hiring Recycling Limited currently operate a material recovery facility and waste transfer facility for the sorting of packaging, construction and demolition wastes at this site. The applicant seeks, seeks an extension to the yard for the relocation of empty skip storage space and to allow for a new one-way traffic system and external storage space. The applicant has a scope for four additional waste coats to divert more waste from landfill using their current plant and resources. The tires will be car and van tires only to bail and send away for processing and recycling. Small levels of bonded asbestos are difficult for contractors to dispose of, which can lead to fly tipping and other issues for local authorities. The applicant is one of the largest asbestos skip hire disposal companies in Northern Ireland and are competent at the handling of bonded asbestos wastes. 
The application will also allow Portadown Recycling the ability to have a skip designated for electronic electrical equipment waste, which will make the processing and cycling of such waste easier, as it can be bulk up before transporting uh, under a licensed WEE facility. To mitigate impact and noise, the near sensitive receptors of three metre high earth bund along the western and northern boundaries of the site are also proposed. In addition to that, a two metre high hedge row along the northern, western and southern boundaries of the site between the security fence and the earth bound is also proposed. PPS 11 cites out the prevailing policy for the development of waste management facilities. Proposals for development of waste management facilities will be subject to a thorough examination of the environmental effects and will only be permitted where it can be demonstrated that all of the criteria are met. As set out in detail within the officer's report, all of the policy subtests are satisfied. Officers of the opinion that the environmental impact of proposed development is acceptable, such that it complies with the SPPS and policies A WM1 and WM2 of PPS 11. The nearest noise sensitive receptors to the existing recycling plant and yard are the dwellings to Ashfield Manor, which are approximately 30 metres from the midpoint of the extended yard. There is also development at 16 Loch Gall Road under plan reference N 2007-0909 that is plan of permission for 20 dwellings. At present, there is a foundation for a single dwelling on this site and for robustness, officers have assessed this development as being extant. A three metre high bond proposed will fully screen all of the proposed properties and lands adjacent to number 16 Loch Gall Road and Ashfield Manor from the development. In addition, it will provide at least 10 decibels in all garden areas and living rooms, with a 5 decibel attenuation in any fourth floor level bedrooms. Officers in consultation with the Environmental Health Department of the Council have no objections to this, subject to con conditions that these bonds are to be provided for either proposal common operational. As regards to access, movement and parking, there will be no change to the number of vehicles currently using the site. As such, officers are of the opinion that proposal would not adversely affect features of natural heritage or would not likely have a significant effect, effect on any European site as set out in PPS2, natural heritage. All the objections have been fully considered and officers are of the opinion that proposed development complies with area plan, the SPPS and all other relevant planning policies. And on this basis and subject to conditions attached within your report, it is recommended that the plan of permission be granted. Uh, just taking members through the PowerPoint presentation. That's the location within the general area, so it's the west of Portadown, a urban area. Okay, next slide, please. And that's the aerial view of the post site. So it is within the existing complex of the waste management facility, a small extension of the yard to the southeast. Okay, next slide, please. So that's the site location plan showing the area which is to be developed outlined in red. Next slide, please. And that's the post site layout showing where the proposed storage beds are going in, a race, in addition to the types of waste that will be going into those storage beds. Uh, next slide, please. So there are sections through every single dwelling that bound the site at Ashfield Manor. So there's nine sections taken them through. So we are clear in regard there is a level difference. Ashfield Manor, Manor is almost three metres below the existing site. Uh, and therein there is an earth bond to be created uh, around the periphery of the site. Next slide, please. That's just following on from the sections. Next slide, please. There's also sections through, that's the extent approval uh, under 2007. So we've got sections through that as well to show that there's a landscape bound. So if those ever be constructed, at least those are protected uh, from future activities at the site. Next slide, please. So that's just a typical elevation of the storage space and floor plan. So they're three meter high concrete um, elevations on three sides. Next slide, please. And that's a tire bailing unit will be used for um, bailing a uh, car and van tires only. Next slide, please. So this is the rear of Ashfield Manor. So their, their garden areas are level and then there's a slope uh, towards the, the site. But that has all been planted out over the years. So it is quite a dense vegetation. Behind that vegetation, you see there will also be a uh, further three metre high uh, landscape bound. But it will not be any higher than what you're seeing there at present. Next slide, please. That's just within the yard to be extended. So at the minute, it's just um, an open yard, which previously was an oil st uh, storage depot. And that's just going to be extended out. So it will allow the applicant for a one-way traffic in through that building there, drop the waste off, and then out through the far side. So it's a much better operation for the applicant. Next slide, please. 
So that is forty-eight uh, where the bond is to be located. So them skips will be moved back, and the bond will be along the western boundary. Next slide, please. So four new bail locations. That's to the south. That will be where the um power bailing unit will also be located. So that's where the existing oil uh, storage depot was located. Next slide, please. That just shows a location from the Brownstown Road. It actually is a Google image, but the building in question is, is where that actually arrow is. So it's in behind uh, the existing operations there. So the visual implications of this uh, is legible. Next slide, please. And that just shows the access location from Brownstown Road, which doesn't need any improvements because it can facilitate HTV vehicles at present. And I think that's it, members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sinead. Okay, members, we have Mr. Bobby Jamison from Port Henry Recycling to make it easier for, for questions. Okay, so it's over to yourselves. Any questions of um, our planner of Mr. Jamison? Okay, Councillor O'Dowd, please. Thank you, Chair. It was just, I did notice that one of the, the issues that residents had was vermin, which I can identify with. Um, but surely with the type of stuff that you're recycling, there shouldn't be any. Um, am I right in saying that? Because usually it, it would be food and things like that that would go for it. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, um, on our site as well, we do have another facility, um, not owned by us, but um, do... Um, sheep heights. Um, so they've actually, since then, are leaving uh, the premises here. Hopefully by mid mid year. So that will hopefully cancel that. It was as as we are the owner of the site was linked to us, but um, it wasn't actually doing anything to do with our recycling facility. It was coming from another company within the site. The complex. Okay. Thank you, Mister Johnson, and as your dad, go ahead. But surely that would be addressed now, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. He's nodding his head for, for yeah. the purpose of, <laughs> of the minutes. Uh, any other questions, members? Yeah. Going to move on then to the bit. Any, any views or comments to make? Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Chair. No, just. Basically, it seems good opportunity for Port Down for job more job creation within the area. I know it's a thriving building, you know, business site at the minute. Uh, plenty of activity in and out, and you know, anything to sort of enhance that. I would be leaning towards that there and keeping a type of rubbish away from landfills. I'm well, happy. Thank you very much for your comments. And Councillor O'Dowd, please. Sorry. Um thanks, Chair. I'm not happy or I'm not happy. I'm not, I'm not sure whether Councillor Duffy actually proposed. No. Okay, well then we're, we're on debate yet. Alderman Kennedy, please. Thank you, Chair. I'd welcome this uh, anything at all till uh Keep uh, they talk about uh, landfill, but more a lot of asbestos and tires and stuff with all these fly tip because there was nowhere or at high expense. So if there's somewhere you can take it, it it would be a big benefit. I think you know. So uh, I think it's a plus. Thank you very much, David or Vice Chair. Okay, no other comments. Okay, members, we'll go for a uh, decision. And we'll go for uh, Councillor Mutri, please. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, as we've uh, seen so far, I think uh, there uh, it's a pretty extensive uh, report here before us. Um, and it's it seems we've addressed a number of issues. And I think uh, the consideration for objections have been addressed here. Um, and as has been outlined by Councillor Duffy, this is a thriving um, business in a, in a 
uh, an area of high activity. Um, so I would be content to uh, proceed with the officer's recommendation and uh, pass this as an approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. And um, Councillor Duffy, please. I'll second that proposal, Chair. Thank you. Yep. Okay, members, proposed by Councillor Mutri and second by Councillor Duffy that we go with the officer's recommendation. We all content? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, members. Okay. Thank you. Can we move on to appendix? Number six, okay, application number LA08 2023-2012F. That's an approval for Rich Hill Amalgamated Football Club. And I'm going to bring in Trudy Chapman, Senior Planning Officer, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. Members, we have Colin, Mr. Colin Lindsay of CT Lindsay Chartered Architect Limited, who is here as the agent in support of the application, and they are he is via Zoom, okay. And Trudy, going to bring you over to yourself. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. This application seeks to replace an existing grass football pitch with a synthetic football pitch. Provision of additional car parking, floodlights, fencing and ball stop netting. Changing rooms, meeting room and creation of a spectator hard standing area and associated site works. It's before you this evening as the council has an interest in the land. The proposal seeks to replace the existing grass playing surface with a 3G synthetic surface. An area of gravel hard standing is to be provided around the east, south and west edges of the pitch to provide a better visitor experience for the spectators who normally watch the matches from these areas. An additional nine car parking spaces are to be provided adjacent to the existing car park on an area which is currently grass. The proposal also includes the provision of six 18 metre floodlights, which will be coiled with the lighting directed towards the pitch. Two small prefabricated buildings are to be erected. One is to be a small meeting area and the other is to provide changing facilities. A small switch room is also to be erected to house the electrics associated with the works proposed. At present, there is existing fencing around the pitch and a ball stop netting behind both goals. This fencing and ball stop fencing is to be augmented and the current gaps filled with new fencing and ball stop netting. New fencing is also to be provided along both lengths of the pitch. The site is located within the development limits of Rich Hill as defined in the Armagh Area Plan. The land is not zoned but is considered to constitute open space and as such OS1 of PPS8 applies. In this instance, officers are of the view that the only space to be lost is that to be used for the changing rooms, the meeting room and the car parking and that this minor development will bring substantial community benefits by way of enhancing the existing facilities available at the site and therefore providing an enhanced visitor experience that can be considered as an exception under the policy. The application site is located adjacent to a corridor of mature trees and vegetation, which may provide habitat for bats. In order to protect these habitats, officers have included a condition limiting the use of floodlights. This condition will, however, also protect the residential amenity of the dwellings beyond this vegetation. The application site is hydrologically linked by a small watercourse to the south, um, to Loch Ney ASSI and Loch Ney and Loch Beg SPA and Ramsar sites. Therefore, a habitats regulations assessment has been carried out. As detailed in the report, consultees, including DERA and SES, are content with the proposals subject to the conditions which we have detailed in the report. Members are advised that no objections were received and officers recommend approval subject to the conditions listed. And I'll just take you through the slides, please. So this is our site uh, within the general area and our site location plan. This is an aerial photograph of the site within the wider area. So that shows that the whole of, of Rich Hill and the, our site is just slightly south of center of that photograph. Next one, please. So this is the aerial photograph of the site. This shows the whole wider site, including the recreation center, and the bowling green and the pitches and play park to the north of our application site. Next slide, please. So this photograph is taken from the ecological statement and it probably maybe gives a better representation of, of what's on the site at present than the, the aerial photographs do. And the next one, please. So this is taken from the existing car park looking east. So um, to the left of the photograph, you've got the existing uh, recreation centre and to the right is the pitch, the, the actual play on pitch that this application relates to. Next slide, please. 
So this is um, from the same vantage point looking slightly further north. Um, from that point, you'll see um, there's a small uh, multi-surface pitch at that point. And the, again, the recreation center off to the right. Next slide, please. So this is taken, this area of green between the existing pitch and the recreation center is where the nine car parking spaces would be provided just adjacent to the existing car park. So the top one's looking looking south towards it and the bottom photograph's looking back up north towards the same uh, piece of grass. Next slide, please. So this is taken from the existing car park looking southeast across the pitch. Um, from that photograph, you can't see it, but you probably can on your, your iPads, but you can see the ball stop Nelly. Um, just at the back of the, the goals. Next slide, please. And this is taken from the training pitch looking across. So where the existing uh, advertising is, a new fence will run along there. Um, it's a, a 1.2 metre fence as far as I can remember. And the next slide, please. And then again, this is taken from the bottom end of the pitch looking back up towards the recreation centre. You'll see the mature trees that were referred to in the report just there to the left of the, the picture. Next slide, please. And this is taken at the rear boundary. And again, it's hard to tell on that, but you can, can see the ball stop net, which has obvious gaps in it and that's to be uh, replaced. Next slide, please. So these are the existing and proposed site plans. Um, and if we go to the next one, please, Paula. So what I've done in this is, is highlighted the main areas. They're a bit hard to, to figure out on the, the earlier one. So I've highlighted on it um, where we've got uh, new elements that are being introduced. Um, next slide, please. So these are the meeting room, the changing room, the floodlights, and the, the very small switch room at the bottom. Next slide, please. And that's our proposed fencing and our ball stop netting. And that should be all of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trudy. I'm going to bring in Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It was just um, Trudy got speaking before I could get my light on, but it was just to declare um, an interest in this one. I've been supportive vocally in committees about the long term lease associated with this site, and then I've been chasing updates and stuff with planners just you know to get to this point. So on that basis, I'm not going to take part in the discussion. So I leave the room. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alderman. I'm going to bring in Mr. Lindsay uh, online, Colin. How you doing? Okay, Mr. Lindsay, you have three minutes. Um, when I, whenever you start, the, the clock will start, okay? Uh, thank you for letting me attend. Uh, I actually don't want to say anything, anything more than Trudy. I'm obviously in support of the application and I'm really only here in case any of your shells have questions that uh, Trudy couldn't answer. So that, that's no me problem. done. Obviously very much in support of what Trudy has said. Uh, All right, thank you. Thank you, as well within your three minutes, so thank you. <laughs> okay, members, over to yourselves. Any questions? Yeah, no questions. Any comments? Okay, uh, let me see. Councillor Armstrong, Alderman County, then Councillor Lavery. Councillor Armstrong, please. <sighs> Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. I just it's great to see that uh, something I guess here, local football clubs are looking to um develop uh, their pitches and take good pride in it. Um, I think it's something as long as it's meeting all policies and uh, the planners are happy enough with it. You know, I think we can be nothing but supportive. Um, and it's and I know it's, I know that the Rich Hill Football Club will be. Looking forward to having it, and when it comes to the rainy days, they'll not have to worry about flooding of pitches, which I'm sure a lot of clubs dealt with over Christmas time. So, I'm I'm fairly happy enough with that plan and application. Thank you very much, Councillor. I'm going to bring in Alderman Kennedy, please. Thank you, Chair. I welcome this as well. It's a thriving wee community hub there with a lot of young youth teams and everything, and the additional car parking will be very welcome for. Uh, on a Saturday and, and even through the week sometimes it was a very busy location so uh, I think it's a, a good development Thank you very much Alderman and Councillor Lowry please online Yeah thank you Chair obviously I was reading, reading through the report there and sort of like similar to Colin the application kind of does the talking for itself um, seems to be very well thought out and would 
deliver improved value for the community. So I think the recommendation to approve is the right one in this instance. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Councillor. Okay, members, we're going to move on to decision. There's no other comments. Alderman Kennedy, please. Uh, I'm happy enough to accept the Alderman's recommendation. Take Yes, proposed by Alderman Kennedy. Councillor Armstrong, please. Yes, and I second that one as well. Okay, members, we have a proposal by Alderman Candy, second by Councillor Armstrong. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you, and thank you very much, Mr. Lindsay, for your speedy uh, talk there. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, okay, thank members, you move much. on to... Thank you. Move on to Appendix 2, Application Number LA08-2022-0958, and it's refusal. I'm going to bring in Mr. Liam McCrum, Senior Planning Officer, to present... The report and PowerPoint presentations over to yourself, Liam. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this application seeks outline planning permission for a dwelling in compliance with policy CTY2A around the clustering and policy CTY6 under personal and domestic circumstances. The application is before members, as it was called in the committee by Councillor Greenfield. This application site lies in the Open country site is defined in the local area plan. Therefore, the uh, principal plan and policies for consideration of this application are the SPPS and PPS 21. Uh, CTY 1 and PPS 21 identifies a range of types of developments that are acceptable in principle. One of these is CTY 2A, new dwellings and existing clusters, and the second is policy CTY 6, personal and domestic circumstances. So we'll take policy CTY 2A first. Uh, it's in relation to new dwellings and existing clusters and states that planning permission will be granted for a new dwelling at an existing cluster provided all six of the criteria specified have been met. In this case, officers consider that the application is not located within an existing cluster of development. Notwithstanding that the proposal does not comply with the headnote of CTY2A, consideration of the proposal against each of the defined criteria is set out in the officer's report. So just as a, a way of memory, in respect of criteria one, officers consider that the existing cluster of development is set a feedback from a public road along a private laneway and that the application site is not located within this cluster. Therefore, the proposal fails to comply with criterion one. In respect of criterion two, it requires that the cluster appears as a visual entity in the local landscape. As stated, the cluster at numbers 47, 49, 55 and 57 Listenary Road do appear as a visual entity in the local landscape. However, the application site is divorced from these and therefore this aspect of CTY2A is not complied with. Criteria 3 requires that the cluster is associated with a focal point or social community building or is located at a crossroads. In this instance, whilst there is a cluster's development, it is some 240 metres away from the primary school of Ballydown, and therefore that aspect of criteria CTY2A is not complied with. Criteria three requires, or sorry, criteria four requires that the application site provides a suitable degree of enclosure and is bounded on at least two sides with other development within the cluster. Officers consider that this proposal fails to comply with this aspect of the policy as set out in the report. The fifth criterion requires that development of the site can be absorbed into the existing cluster through rounding off and consolidation and will not significantly alter its existing character or visually intrude into the countryside. Officers consider that this site is not part of a cluster and therefore the proposal fails this aspect of the policy test. The last criterion requires that development would not adversely impact on residential amenity. Officers consider a dwelling in this site would not impact on residential amenity as the closest dwelling is located some 60 metres away. So therefore, the sixth criterion of the policy test is complied with. In the round, officers consider the proposed development fails to comply with policy CTY2A of PPS 21, specifically criterion 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, as set out in detail in the report. Members are advised that a case was also made in compliance with policy CTY6 of PPS 21. Officers' consideration is set out in detail in the confidential report that has been circulated. Officers are of the opinion that the applicant has failed to demonstrate that a new building is a necessary response to the particular set of circumstances and that genuine hardship would be caused if planning permission were refused. 
Furthermore, the applicant has failed to demonstrate there are no alternative solutions to meet the particular circumstances of the case. So for the reasons set out in the report, officers consider the proposal is contrary to policy CTY2A and policy CTY6 of PPS21, and therefore refusal is recommended. There's been no third party representations on this one, so uh, I'll just go through the PowerPoint presentation. So this is our application site within the, the local area, just outside Banbridge. This is our site location plan. Just an aerial photograph of the site. You can see the Ballydown Primary School in the surroundings there, just at the crossroads. This is a view across the site frontage. You can see the land rising. View towards the site, looking southerly direction. Looking back towards the site from the northerly direction. View from within the site, looking towards the row. And another view of the site. So there's a long distance view of the site from the Castle Welland Road. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Liam. Okay, members, the the report and presentation over to your shells for any questions. No. Okay, Liam, just one quick question, and I know it, it's sort of on on the medical issue. No, sort of from um, I need to try and word this correctly. Um, from some some of the agencies I worked with, like the housing executive, if I wanted sort of. To, to get extra points for someone, I would need to get specialist, um, sort of the consultants' recommendations. I know that the, there's a letter here from the GP, but do you, would you say would a consultant's letter, would, would that be if more beneficial than the GPs? Would that help sort of put more weight on it, on the, the application or not? Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, there's no there's no defined way of making personal circumstances. They're all different. And basically, it's our job just to assess the information in front of us. But if I can go through what's set out in the policy, it might give you some sort of idea of what we would expect as a minimum of a submission. So the first bullet point there states that we should have a statement detailing the special personal or domestic circumstances supported, if appropriate, by medical evidence from a medical or health professional. The second bullet point is detailing the level of care that is required in relation to any medical condition, again supported by the appropriate health professional, the identity of the main care, their current address and occupation. Third point, there is an explanation of why care can only be provided at the specific location and how genuine hardship would be caused if planning permission were refused. The fourth bullet point details of what alternatives to a new dwelling have been considered, e.g. an extension, an annex to the existing dwelling, and why such alternatives are not considered practical to meet the specific need, and any other information considered relevant to the particular case. So that gives you the idea of the level of detail that we would expect on, on these particular type of applications. There is some level of detail submitted with the application, but there certainly is gaps in what is specified in the policy requirement. No, fully got it. Thank you very much, Liam. Okay, members, any other questions? Okay, any comments? Move on to the debate. Mr. Wilson, please. Um, thank you, Chair. J just say, just reading over um, your comments, really in the, in the vein of Alderman Bard or a Chair comment previously. Uh, this applicant seems to have various, you know, medical conditions. Obviously, uh, maybe maybe some of it related to his previous employment or whatever. And uh, I, I think you know, I think we need to look at this in the round and get a more of a a, a broader medical view on on how this you know if this property was built, how it would help him mentally and physically. I think you know we'll have a letter from a GP, but I think possibly he should maybe have the opportunity to. Um, give more detailed information on his medical condition currently and moving forward in the future. 
you know, I think, you know, going by GP letter, I think maybe we should have given him the opportunity to, to provide more information that uh, we can look at it in the round. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. I'm going to bring back in Liam here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Wilson, just I suppose it just we have give the I mean this application is quite old, and we have had meetings and give appeal decisions to the uh, applicant as a means to try and give them a. a a sort of what the expectation levels would be. So we have been waiting on information for quite uh, quite some time and there have been opportunities afforded to them to actually produce that. Um, and I mean, we didn't take this forward forward lightly, I suppose we we did give, you know, it's a it's an application from 2022 and we're now in 2024. So there has been a significant, you know, there has been a fair bit of work going on behind the scenes to try and get tease out the information that we thought would have brought it to potentially where the applicant wanted to go, but we, we just haven't got it. Thank you very much, Liam. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor. Okay, members, no, no more comments? Okay, I'm going to push you for a decision. Councillor Duffy, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I know this committee do all they can, you know, to try and, you know, accommodate people, but in this case, I would say we have to go with the officer's recommendation to refuse the application, Chair. Sure. And Councillor O'Dowd, please. Yes, Chair, I'll second Councillor Duffy's proposal. Um, I think they have been given ample time to produce doctor's letters, things like that, like we're into 2024 now and it hasn't been produced, so I'm happy enough to second Councillor Duffy's. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Dredd. Okay, members, we have a proposal Proposal by Councillor Duffy and second by Councillor Dowd that we go with the, the officer's recommendation. Well, agreed. Okay, agreed. Okay, thank you very much, members. Okay, move on to Appendix 5, application number LA08 2023 2172F. And it's approval. And I'm going to bring in Mr. Liam McCrum again, Senior Planning Officer, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. Been busy tonight, Liam. So Bring you back in here. Thank you, Chair. Um, this application seeks full planning permission for the erection of replacement dwelling and lands at 20 Circular Road, Bombridge. The application is before members as the applicant is an immediate relative of a member of the planning staff. In terms of the principle of development, the application site lies in the countryside as defined in the area plan. The SPPS and PPS 21 are the Principal planning policies relevant to consideration of this proposed development. CTY1 and PPS21 identifies a range of types of development acceptable in principle, one of these being CTY3, replacement dwellings. Policy CTY3 requires that the building to be replaced exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling and as a minimum to have all structural walls substantially intact. In this case, the building to be replaced is a dwelling which is currently inhabited and therefore meets the aspect of the policy test. Officers also consider that this dwelling is not to be of listed non-listed vernacular and are content that the building can be demolished. In terms of siting, the new dwelling will be sited within the existing cartilage of the existing building. Therefore, the development complies with this aspect of the policy test. In terms of size, the proposed dwelling is unlikely to have a greater visual impact than the dwelling to be replaced as the proposed house type is similar to the building to be replaced. In terms of the provision of services, given the presence of an occupied dwelling on the site, officers have no concerns in this regard. In terms of design, officers are content that the design is suitable for this rural location. Therefore, there are no concerns with this aspect of the policy test. In terms of access, officers in consultation with DFI roads have raised no concerns and are content the, policy, the proposal complies with policy MP2 of PPS3. In terms of impact on residential amenity, officers have no concern in relation to the impact on residential amenity given the separation distances to neighbouring properties. 
In terms of other environmental implications, it has been demonstrated through the submission of a biodiversity checklist and associated ecological statement that there are no protected sites, habitats or species present at the site and that no further ecological survey work is required. The application site also falls within a consultation zone of historic monument. Officers in consultation with NIEA are content the proposal is satisfactory to the SPPS and PPS6 and therefore approval is recommended subject to the conditions. I want to run through the PowerPoint. It's the location of our site within the general area. This is our site location plan. Site layout plan, so you can see the site is set some distance down a private laneway off the public road. These are the elevations of the proposed house type, single story. These are the floor plans. Aerial photograph of the site. You can see the existing buildings in situ. This is a view of the site from Circular Road, so you can see it's a fair distance off the road and it takes a good eye to see it. This is our access point to the site from the public road, so you can see it's some distance from the road. This is the dwelling to be replaced, currently occupied. Side elevation of that dwelling. That's the other side elevation of the dwelling with the outbuilding, looking back towards the public road. And again, just another view of one of the outbuildings on the site. That building is to be retained. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Liam. Okay, members, open to yourselves. Any questions? No questions? Yeah, any comments? No comments? Okay, members, can I get our proposal of sorts for the recommendation? Councillor Alderman Kennedy, just speak to you to it, Councillor. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I think it's just uh, it ticks all the boxes. It's just a sort of an upgrade, and, and it's not much of a change, really. Uh, site location, and so on. So I'm happy enough to propose we accept the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much, Alderman and Councillor Duffy. Please. Yes, I'll second the officer's recommendation, Chair. Sure. Okay, members, we have. Had a proposal by Alderman Kennedy, second by Councillor Duffy, that we go ahead with the officer's recommendation. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much, members, and thank you very much to your planners and to yourselves and to members of the public who come to Democratic Services for this afternoon and this evening. So see you at home and enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay, thank you.